What is going on, Superman's Comics family? It is Brian and Jack, and we are here with the new week. So, of course, you know we're coming with this comic book market trends. That's right. This is that three up, three down. And we're going to kick it off with those up trends, right? Everyone wants to know what's hot first. We like to save the cold, the buying opportunities, bring that in towards the end. So make sure you watch the complete video so you don't miss out on those buying opportunities. But we're getting into the up right now, and the first one we're talk about IDW San Diego Comic Con Vance. A lot of people say this could be cold because the way the site handled that was kind of atrocious. But either way, those books are hot fire. People are buying them. They sold out quick. What do you think, Jack? Yeah, I mean, I certainly experienced firsthand the frustration of trying to get those books and the websites not being able to handle it. Um, I think the print runs were too low for those books. Many of the print runs were in like that two to 300 level. Um, and I think certainly with it being open access at home versus on the convention floor, I really think IDW should have extended those print runs probably until the four digit range um, to be able to really satisfy. But either way, look at the secondary market prices being paid for these books. And with, we're used to seeing that post San Diego, but we're not used to seeing IDW dominate. Although if you think back to last year, Canto was kind of one of the standout books of SDCC. And it is again this year with the one shot, but we also had the Transformers My Little Pony crossover variant doing ungodly money right off the bat. Um, you've got the Pichomoko Usagi Yohimbo being probably the winner of the group, striking at a good time right after the announcement of that property coming to Netflix. Um, there was also the Peach Momoko, uh, I think Sleeping Beauties uh, variant. So um, there was stuff from Sonic and Ninja Turtles, a great uh, Jenica number three cover. Um, they had a little bit of everything um, represented that IDW kind of uh, is behind and is really pushing from a publishing angle right now. And they all sold out and they're all doing well. So great to see even with the, the con going virtual, and we're certainly going to talk about a lot of the negatives of that. Um, it was good to see this element of the convention still staying strong and possibly being even stronger. Yeah, I had a little solidarity going with one of the Simple Man's Comics family and Lala Schultz. And we, we teamed up scouring that site for three days trying to get copies of Canto but they were able to secure copies and you mentioned the print runs and how they sold out quick had it gone off without a hitch like they were planning on day one they were only they were limiting 10 copies a person right they finally got it fixed they at least limited it down to two so they were sold out a lot quicker for sure but sticking with IDW and going over into the next one on three up portion, we are talking about that Ninja Turtle ongoing series. We have been stamping our foot about this, trying to get the viewers to pay attention. This series is super hot right now, especially from a reader perspective. Now the secondary market's starting to catch up on it as well. Yeah, you know, a previous younger Jack would have stomped his feet and uh, it would have turned into his alter ego, Mr. Bolo, and said, now we told you to be on the lookout for, for this run right now. Um, I'm 35 years old now. I, you know, I just had a birthday, Brian. I've got new new perspective. And uh, I, I think that this was, this was due to happen. Um, look, we did talk about it and we actually had it on the down portion of this same list, which this, that's my favorite thing about this show is that something can legitimately go from being on a down portion, totally overlooked. We talked about it from all of the reasons why you should be hyped. 101 being the first appearance of Mona Lisa and Lita. 102 being the first appearance of the three weasels. And 105 being the uh, formation of the Splinter Clan, the addition of Alopex onto the team, her getting the green bandana, becoming the sixth member, and the team now being named the Splinter Clan, as well as uh, you know all of those children being adopted into the fold and joining in. Um, so much going on, so much positivity, so much to be excited about. And we didn't understand why. Nobody was paying attention. And it wasn't like mainstream media wasn't talking about it. Comicbook.com, CBR, they were covering it. But you know what? The comic buying uh, community has gotten too reliant on apps and spec sites to tell them what to buy. And since those apps and spec sites had not alerted them to these books, things weren't moving. And then once kind of people started to talk about it, and, and maybe we got some of that ball rolling, but once people started to talk about these issues, man, the credit goes to Sophie Campbell, the writer and artist and creator of these characters who has really transformed um, mutated, if you will, the, the TMNT universe. And uh, we're excited to get to sit down and interview her right here on the Silver Woods Comics YouTube channel for Mainframe Comic Con. 
Yes, Mainframe Comic Con. If you're unaware, that's kicking off August 15th and 16th. Go to mainframecomiccon.com. Get all the details. Whole bunch of guests that they're going up on that con. So check it out. And we're going to shift to that last one on the three up. This is one that a lot of people have been talking about. We always talk about Donny Cates' Thor. We always talk about Donny Cates' Venom. But what's hot in Venom right now? We're talking about that character virus. Right. It, it seems like we're constantly talking about this run, Thor. Um, previously, the Thanos run. We're just always talking Donny Cates. And every time a new character comes into the fray, he seems to get immediate attention. Um, virus to such a degree that the argument about first appearance, I will say, has been actually pretty pleasant in the comic community. I think Batman Beyond, he took a lot of heat off of this virus debate because virus, instead of everybody arguing about 25 or 26 or the, the intended first appearance free comic book day, uh, number one of, of that amazing Spider-Man, um, people are buying all of them. So 25 is on fire. 26 is on fire. 25 second prints are on fire. 25, 26 second prints look like they're getting 25.6. <laughs> um, and now the free comic book day issue. If you look at like lots of 10 is selling for like three and $4 per issue for a free issue that just came out. So um, it wasn't e readily distributed the same way free comic book day issues are usually distributed. So um, there should be plenty of them out there, but people are buying them up. They don't care. They see the value in this character a lot of speculation of who this could be um I, i've really removed myself from that speculation guessing game um but either way i will say that th this character is hot all of these books have merit and value and certainly are books that sh you should be paying attention to and uh you know ride this virus wave i don't know it, the, oh, i don't know if now's the time to sell or if we should hold out for more been burnt by holding out i would probably be happy to cash out my virus money now but let us know in the comment section are you long-term holders on virus or do you think that there's going to be a story swerve in here somewhere yeah and not taking anything away donny cates deserves the credit he gets but can we also get an amen for ryan stegman's covers and Oof. mark bagley's interior art all that put together makes the story what it is fantastic run right now and like you said it's super hot. That's why it's on the three up, three down. And it closes out the three up portion this week, right? Yep. So we're going to shift right now into that downward trend. And we talked about this during our San Diego Comic-Con recap. We recapped all four days of San Diego Comic-Con that's up on the channel right now. But we talked about the news cycle that takes place outside of the con. And one of those top stories was Tom King, right? That's right. Tom King, um, you know, really should be being celebrated right now because – Rorschach is coming and Rorschach number one. And um, I think that there was negativity towards the Watchmen brand in general um, because before Watchmen was kind of seen as a, as a big failure. Um, but Watchmen TV show a hit, um, Doomsday Clock a hit. People are excited for Watchmen. Tom King gets announced for Rorschach. Uh, regardless of how you feel about Tom King as a writer, he writes mental issues really well i think he's gonna kill this should be talking about nothing but that but instead tom king takes to twitter and takes issue with a variant cover the cover b uh which is a jay lee variant cover um and he takes issue with dc choosing jay lee as the cover artist because of work that he had previously done for comics gate which is a um comics group some would call them a hate group some would call them uh just a group of like-minded people who are fighting against forced diversity um depending upon how you look at it uh they are very active on social media and and can get aggressive and because of that the comic industry has basically shunned them and tom king took to twitter and said that he didn't want to support that cover b they, he only saw it as there being one cover um and that was fine enough in the statement until it kind of came out in a second tweet that he put out that he had spoken to Jay Lee, um, that Jay Lee wasn't even aware of Comic Skate or who they were, uh, that he wasn't on Twitter and it's really a Twitter thing, um, and that he, any cover he had done, he had been commissioned to do, he wasn't aware of the, the connotation behind it. Um, and so Tom King puts out a tweet saying they spoke best possible solution, everything's all good. Um, and then a day later, Jay Lee puts out a, a statement saying everything is not all good. 
And he talked about some things that really point to the issue of what Tom King did. And we all have people in our lives, and we've seen this in our own personal lives, were a rush to judgment um, rather than confronting a person directly. Um, so Jay Lee talked about how, you know, he had his career put in jeopardy because the, the, the connotation of being associated with this group tends to be uh, career ending in the comics industry right now. So he got put at risk by a rumor somebody spread that wasn't even true. And it really could have been solved, but with Tom King reaching out to Jay Lee and talking to him directly. Um, and certainly I think we've all experienced that in our personal lives where we get characterized a certain way that we feel like isn't fair. And if the person, you know, talked to us directly, um, they would see that. And so I think it's, it's really a messy situation and just one that really, um, regardless of maybe the positive intentions Tom King had, uh, really just ha leaves him looking bad. Yeah, Tom King did put out a lengthy apology after it's all said and done. But, I mean, it just goes to show, don't be an asshat, right? Don't go to Twitter without talking to the guy first right. and then finding out what the – I mean, especially with his background. The background that he has, you think you verify sources and everything before you, you go out and, and blast it to the world. But either way, that kind of transitions us also into – another downward trend with similar situation we're talking about dynamite comics yeah and unfortunately we're talking about comics gate again and um you know comics gate is a group i i don't claim to be any sort of an expert on really truly i'm ignorant to the subject i really stay away from all of that beefing and battling within the comic book industry i got enough of that personally um to stay away from the the i'm like that drake meme you know, right, right. Hey, I stick so, out of it. <laughs> so, like, you and I were slow to this subject when this whole dynamite thing started breaking. We really weren't up on it. Um, it was even in our private conversations, it was something that we had to kind of like delve into and learn about. But to give you the long story short, if you're not familiar with it, uh, out in Civilman's Comics YouTube family, uh, the owner and CEO of, of Dynamite Comics was found to have had a multi year relationship with the founder of Comics Gate, Ethan Van Shriver. Um, this relationship involved business advice. Um, it involved, at times, the printing of books for Comicsgate for their Kickstarter programs. It involved allowing for Comicsgate to sell dynamite variants to create a revenue stream. And then it eventually involved um, a collaborative cover program where Comicsgate covers were uh, comic state characters were featured on the cover with dynamite characters uh, at, and there was also a question of a super chat that was sent during a youtube live stream where the the ceo of dynamite sent a super chat uh during a comic state live stream um and then, then that allowed for deeper delving into dynamite uh you know being one of one of our or if not the only i believe major comic publisher that didn't didn't post anything um about racial injustice or anything on social media post um, George Floyd and the unrest in our country. Um, and it's really started to kind of put a, a spotlight on the individual who runs Dynamite. Well, the reaction to that was several Dynamite writers and artists quitting. And some very prominent, Mark Russell, a longtime writer on Red Sonia, walked away. Um, Christian Ward, who's a certainly extremely talented artist, big name, um, walked away. Uh, a number of other names ha have stepped aside. And most have said, like, they opened the door for a return if the relationship with Comics Gate was ended. And most of the reason why we know all of this is because once a little bit came out, once people saw the, the variant covers on Kickstarter and then saw the Super Chat, then people started delving into the story. That's when apparently... Dynamite severed its ties with Comicsgate, which then caused Ethan Van Shriver to attack and kind of like spill the beans on everything that had been going on between Dynamite and Comicsgate. Real messy, um, but it leaves Dynamite with kind of like, kind of like, you know, some stink in their breath. They had to cancel all of their San Diego Comic-Con appearances because they were worried about backlash. And it's really unfortunate because they have an amazing crossover coming out in October called Dynamite, Die, D-I-E, exclamation mark, Dynamite, which is a total universe crossover. Um, think similar to like uh, Tom Taylor's Deceased for DC Comics, where, you know, Zombified, we're talking Green Hornet, Vampirella, Red Sonya, Deja Thoris, the whole crew. Um, and there should be reason for excitement right now for Dynamite, but unfortunately, they're caught up in some scandal. So we'll, I like the company. I hope they rebound, but, um, you know, they're going to have to clean up some things. 
Yeah, and I'm in comics. Comics is my form of escapism, so I don't pay too much attention. Uh, I buy comics. I always say, buy what I like, right? If I like the creative team behind the book. That's why I think there's great buying opportunities here. Yes, CEO has kind of gotten in some hot water, but I don't fault the creative teams and I don't fault the books that are coming out. There's still some great books out there. You know, they always have great incentives. So I'm really looking forward to that dynamite that's coming out and hopefully not too much more fallout comes out of this. But we're going to shift to that last one of the three down. We talked earlier how we recap San Diego Comic-Con all four days of it. And we were kind of left underwhelmed. I would say uh, expected more, some great panels. There was some great information, but we thought there would be a little bit more gravitas to yes. the panels. Less major news got released than in a typical year at San Diego. That's just a fact. Major panelists like Marvel's Hall H pulled out late in the game, um, weren't even involved. That affects things. Funko comes on uh, on Sunday and really just, I mean, just. Hold my beer. Yeah. I, I, it's funny because they should be celebrated for what they did. But what it did is it really showed what everyone should have done. Because most, a lot of people don't realize most of these San Diego videos were filmed as much as a month in advance. So you, you had plenty of time as a publishing company, as a toy company, um, as a YouTube channel. If you're moderating and you're putting on a special panel or you're a podcaster, you had plenty of time to plan something. Um, right. Keep it real, Brian. Most of the presentations were of lower quality than this very show that people are watching right now. Um, and most delivered you less information that was actually usable to your life today in comics than you're going to get on the show right now. Um, and look, that's San Diego. I hold that in prestige. I, I, one of my career bucket list goals is for Brian and I to host a panel at San Diego Comics. I, it's, it's on my checklist of things that I want to do. Um, and I went and watched this year and I thought, well, damn, we should be hosting a panel on San Diego Comic-Con because I would do this and I would do that and I would do this. Um, and I, these companies have budgets and only Funko took this opportunity and said, okay, we can't do what we normally do. And if you're not familiar, Funko throws a party, I think on Friday nights, Funko Fridays, it's this huge event. They were affected by this more than most companies. And they turned it and, and gave the best possible product they gave. To use kind of an inside term, their video is going to be evergreen because you will, for the next couple months, be able to look back at that video and see the products that are going to be coming out and previews and check them out. Um, and the video is entertaining versus all of these other panels that were just people in screens and a lot of talk about the love of comics, but less talk about the meat and potatoes that people really came to see. Um, so I think kudos to anyone who did it because like Brian and I are involved in the plannings of a virtual convention. It is a million moving pieces. I by no means am trying to minimize the work that people have done. I just think that people missed an opportunity and I think it's fair to say that. And I think if anyone was involved and was a company involved in a panel and doesn't go and watch Funko and go, I could have done more, then I think that they're not being honest with themselves. Yeah. And it was just weird. I mean, I enjoyed being at home. We talked about how that, you know, we had a little bit more access than we normally would, but um, Which it was, was cool. weird. There wasn't as many comic exclusives. Uh, who knows? I think they made the best out of the situation that they had given, given COVID, but either way, it's on the down, and that's going to be our three up, three down. As always, comment. Let us know what you think is hot. Let us know what you think is cold. This is Brian Jack with Superman's Comics. We'll see you guys in the next video. Hey, feel I'm in the mood for a switch up. I hit the function, hit the rose till I hiccup. I hit the stage and leave with money that's a stick up. She picture perfect, so I told him.